All right, everyone, grab your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, as we will be continuing on in our series through Paul's letter to the churches in Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 4, and we will begin today looking at the second half of chapter 4, beginning in verse 17. So Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 17, and we will be looking at verse 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21 today. And so if you would, please stand with me for the honoring and reading of God's holy, infallible, and all-sufficient word. The title of today's message is Taught uh, by the Heavenly Schoolmaster. Uh, verse 17, this is the word of God. Therefore, this I say and testify in the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind being darkened in their mind, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you heard him and were taught in him, uh, just as truth is in Jesus. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat and uh, get your eyes back on verse 17. As we begin this morning, I want to ask you a very pointed question, a question uh, that is no doubt probing, and a question that maybe you haven't asked yourself before in all seriousness. And that question is this, are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? And here's a follow-up question. How do you know that you are, in fact, a Christian? Is it a fuzzy feeling that you have? Or uh, is it maybe a objective kind of standard that you've created in your head? If you can answer yes to this question, is it because you feel as though Christ is everything that he has taught you in him? Or is it rather that you have tidied up your life in such a way that you no longer look like the guy you used to be or the woman that you used to be before now? Yeah. Heart posture matters when we answer this question. For instance, in Luke 18, uh, there is a parable that is given of a Pharisee and a tax collector, and uh, these two people are compared against one another. The Pharisee in Luke 18, uh, verses 11 and 12, goes to pray to God, and this is his prayer. I thank you that I am not like other people. Swindlers, unjust adulterers, or even like the tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. And so you see, his heart is one of me. Me, me, me. Uh, but the other man, the tax collector who is commended in this parable in Luke chapter 18, verse 13, has a much different prayer. Standing some distance away from this Pharisee, unwilling to lift up his own eyes to heaven because of maybe the shame or guilt that he had felt, I was beating his chest, and he was saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Well, the good news is you don't have to wait too long to find out whether or not 
Your answer to this question is one that is right or wrong. Now, this text here in many ways is going to be the schoolhouse of the soul, where our heavenly schoolmaster, Jesus Christ the righteous, is calling people through his servant Paul to a life that looks like a life that would be a saved life. And this is no ordinary classroom and Here in these halls of divine instruction, namely the scriptures, the lessons come not in textbooks and chalk, but from the Holy Spirit as he applies the truth himself. A curriculum etched in the hearts and the minds of those who have been called out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And so as we look at Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17, uh, though we are most certainly caught up in the flow of an argument... Uh, Paul is addressing the Ephesian believers with the weighty urgency uh, that it is to walk worthy, right? We've already looked at this. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul exhorts, right, uh, all of the Ephesian church members and us by extension to walk worthy of the calling with which we have been called. And then he gets into some unifying pieces and shows us why we are to do that and and who we are to do that in and by what authority as we have transitioned from doctrine to duty. And here he's going to put some skin on it in a very big way. So in many ways, though we're leaning into this concept of what it means to be a new man or a new creature in Christ Jesus, in many ways it's a continuation of what it means to walk worthy. And the way in which we walk worthy, according to the text in front of us, is to abandon sinful ways. In other words, people who have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, people who have been rescued from Satan, sin, death, and hell, no longer live in it, no longer prize and prioritize it, and no longer think like sinners. And this is profound. It's profound, especially in context, because the Ephesian church was an Ephesian church. That is, that it was in Ephesus. And Ephesus, if you remember, was full of carnality, full of idolatry, full of the worst kind of sin that you could ever even imagine. It was the, in many ways, cultural hub of the Roman Empire. Everything that it had to offer by way of debauchery was there. As a matter of fact, one of the seven great wonders of the world, there. The the temple to Artemis, where there was temple prostitution going on, and many, many other horrible things like sorcery and, and whatnot, which is why when there was this great revival in the book of Acts, in the city of Ephesus, they went and burned their books because they were filled with man's wisdom and sorcery, and it was not God's word. And Paul is wanting them to understand here, like I'm wanting you to understand now, uh, that where you are doesn't really matter all that much. Here's what I mean by that. And Paul understood when he said these words that the Ephesus church was still going to be in Ephesus. But now they are also in Christ. He knew that the church in Ephesus was going to be among the Gentiles, uh, but they were no longer allowed to look like Gentiles. And in many ways, though we are in Tulsa, we are not to act and think like Tulsans. Though we are in America, we are not to think and act like Americans. We are citizens of a different kingdom. Now, does that mean that we don't engage the political political sphere and care about what's going on around us? Not at all. But what it does mean is that we have a different walk. And that means we have a different pattern of life. And so this message is for us today as much as it was for the Ephesians then. It is demanding, it is convicting, it is clarifying. Uh, But more than that, it is Christ-drenched and it is beautiful. And so as we examine these texts, let us sit at the feet of our great under-teacher, Paul here, and as he points to the great teacher of our souls, that we might grasp the truths here and that we might 
receive them with reverence, and that we might love them and cherish them because they are what help us walk with God. And so look with me at verse 17. The first thing that I want you to see, the first thing that I want you to note is the apostolic admonition to abandon sin. And I know that's a mouthful. The words that start with A are long. The apostolic admonition to abandon sin. Uh, Look with me at verse 17. Paul begins by uh, really continuing on, right? Because that's how Paul operates. Paul says, therefore, because of the things I have just said, uh, this I say. And what are the things he just said? Well, we've just gotten out of a huge, huge treatise, basically, on what it looks like to be the church, that we have been saved uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ, and that we have been given gifts, right? We have been given gifts uh, to serve the body, so salvation is given, We are unified by the Spirit in the body of Christ, and we are uh, given gifts to serve one another by the Holy Spirit and built up by men gifts, or the gifted men given, namely shepherds and teachers, or shepherd teachers, as well as evangelists. And we should therefore walk no longer because of that, you will see, as the Gentiles do. Therefore, because of everything I've just said, that you've been saved, unified, and been given gifts, and men gifts, this I say, and testify in the Lord, that you walk no longer, just as the Gentiles also walk. Now, I want to pause here because I want you to see uh, that this is no ordinary suggestion, but this is, in fact, a command. It's a command... uh, that carries with it not only apostolic authority, uh, but you see here he says, I testify in the Lord. Uh, This word here that's used is the same word that we get our word martyr from, Uh, but it carries with it the weight of a sworn witness. In other words, Paul here is bearing witness in the Lord and in so doing is essentially communicating this idea. It's as if When he says these words, he's standing on holy ground. It's as if Jesus is standing right next to him, uh, making this same plea. Children, would you look at me? I want you to think about it like this. Have you ever been to or seen a a court where people are uh, trying to figure out whether or not people who have committed crimes are guilty? or whether they are innocent, well, there's usually someone standing right next to him. And that person standing right next to him is what is called a lawyer. It's someone who has this person who is being tried or standing in front of the judge. It's it's someone who has his back and has his best interest in mind. Or you could think, and so, and so when he speaks, it's as if the other person is speaking. It's kind of like that. It's kind of like that. And so we must take this command seriously, just as the Ephesian church took it seriously. And what is the command? The command is that we would walk no longer, or the Ephesian church and us by extension would walk no longer, just as the Gentiles also Walk. In other words, Paul is trying to get the Ephesian church and us by extension to understand that we must, if we are to actually be Christian, if we are to actually be a member in the body, to no longer, no longer do what we used to do, all of us. For all of us fall short of the glory of God. And for all of us, we're, according to Ephesians chapter 2, dead in our transgressions and sins. We were all unable to respond to spiritual stimuli. And here, uh, the command is to abandon sin, to abandon a former way of life, to abandon those things in which we used to live, to abandon the things that we used to love and cherish, and to resolve to cut ties with our sinful nature. And why is that? Because of Christ, we have a new one. 
right? We have a new one. We have a new heart. We have new desires. And we have a new way of living life. And it means cutting ourselves off from that old life and every bridge of return. Now, before moving further, it must be stated, and we will state again more plainly, that salvation is not a matter of self-improvement or even of perfection of what has previously existed. And what I mean by that is, when we are transformed by the Holy Spirit, we are not just improved, but we are made new. We are all, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, new creations in Christ Jesus. That means when the Lord saves us, we get a new mind, a new will, a new heart, a new inheritance, a new relationship, new power, new knowledge, new wisdom, new perception, new understanding, new righteousness, new love, new desires, new citizenship, and I could keep going. It's all new. Jesus is in the business of, as he said in the Gospels, making all things new. Not all things fixed, not all things rehabbed, all things new. That's important. It's important because the command here is no longer to walk in old ways. But we know that if we are saved, then the old ways are no longer ways that we have to walk. Because there's a new way to walk. And walk, of course, we visited this already in the book of Ephesians, but just for the sake of repetition, let me explain it to you again. When the Bible is saying walk, when Paul is saying walk, he's not talking about a stroll down the street. He's talking about a way and pattern of life. So, does this mean that none of us, if we are saved, will in fact never sin? No. But the pattern of our life will be one that is consistently growing in Christ's likeness and looking like Christ because Christ has taught us and revealed himself to us and changed us and regenerated us and made us new. And we can see this as we continue on through our passage, specifically as we look at verse 22 and following, after um, you know, we examine what we are examining today, where it says that we are to lay aside in reference to our former conduct, the old man, uh, that one who clings, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and be renewed in the spirit of our minds, and to be put, and we are to put on the new man, which is in the likeness of God. And it has been created in righteousness and holiness and in truth. So, in other words, to walk worthy is to no longer walk like the Gentiles walk, but to walk like a new man. Throwing off the old man that so loves to cling. And so Gentiles here is representative of all ungodly, unregenerate, pagan persons. Do not act, in other words, like sinners, because your sin has been paid. Friends, do you not understand that to continue to wallow in sin and to pursue pagan uh, values and so on and so forth is, is essentially like a man who has been freed from prison for a crime. And he is more thankful in the moment of that freeing than anyone could ever be. But then, for some unknown reason, decides that what would be best for him is to return to his cell, to ask for the key, to lock it back up, and to throw it away. That's what Paul is saying here. It is absurd for a Christian to return to and wallow in his sin because that sin has been paid for and he has been brought into a body of believers to help him to continue to walk worthy. 
Paul's admonition here then urges everyone to walk as freed and not to walk as prisoners of darkness. Not to be like Israel who preferred their chains. So let me ask you this. What areas of your life, what, what chains are you preferring? What sin are you still clinging to? What are you absurdly engaging in? Knowing that in Christ we have been set free. That we are no longer slaves of sin, but slaves under righteousness. Will you forsake whatever that came to mind at the voice of Christ? And I ask that because this is the word, and this word is the voice of Christ. We as Christians, Paul is testifying in the Lord, are not to, 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 to walk as sinful human beings and how they walk. And that is, in fact, the admonition of the Apostle Paul. The second thing that I want you to see is this. And this is my second point, the futility of fleshly thinking. Paul is now going to give us four reasons why it's absurd, why it's stupid, why it makes no sense to engage in running back. Right? And the first one, of course, is under the futility of fleshly thinking. Look with me again at our theme verse, verse 17. After he has testified in the Lord and charges the people of Ephesus and us by extension, not to walk as the Gentiles walk, he then begins to explain what that walk looks like and how ridiculous it is. The first thing is that... Um, they do so in the, and this is the second half of the verse, in the futility of their mind being darkened in their mind, alienated then from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them. So here we see kind of an umbrella encapsulating the idea that the mind is foolish. It's, it's not right thinking. Paul here is describing the darkened state of the unconverted mind. Of those who know not God, or as Paul would say elsewhere, God does not know them. And he's warning against the vanity of worldly wisdom. This term futility and the Greek really conveys emptiness. Nothing's there. A, a, a mind, as it were, running in circles, chasing down shadows that are playing tricks on someone. In other words, what Paul is trying to get across is the reality that when you think like a sinner, when you engage in fleshly thinking, it is a dead-end road with signs of knowledge but no true wisdom. To engage in certain sins might even seem wise in the moment. And when you are governed by your flesh, but the reality is it's all smoke and mirrors. And so what does this say? It's their, the futility of their mind. It's the ineptness of their mind. Right? Because something happens in Genesis chapter 3, the world gets thrust into sin. And one of the things that it touches, because it touches everything, is the mind. It is the mind. This is what theologians have called the noetic effects of the fall. That means the things that we think, even if they seem to be based in knowledge and in facts, are in fact not. Our ability, in other words, to reason though not completely obliterated, is most definitely sin-marred and sin-stained. And it affects the way in which 
we view things. This is most clearly seen if you want to turn back with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 gives us kind of a 30,000 foot view of God giving people over to their reprobate mind, their, their mind of futility. In verse 18, just beginning where Paul begins here, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who do what? Suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So as we think about darkness in relationship to our text, which is the next thing he says in verse 18, right? Being darkened in their mind. So their, their mind is futile, but also it's darkened. It is a willful darkness. And Later, we will see a little bit further on after it speaks about being alienated from the life of God that it is ignorance that is in us. So our minds are darkened. We are blind. We can't see. Our thinking apart from Christ is is nothing but futility. And we are ignorant of the things of God. And the reason for that is because we don't want to. This says here that the men uh, of unrighteousness suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So in other words, when we look at the world, when we look at people who don't know and love Christ, we're looking at a bunch of people who aren't just not agreeing with us or not just not seeing what we want them to see. Uh, When we go do apologetics, for example, or we go and do evangelism, we're not trying to teach somebody something that they aren't already aware of, whether they know it or not. We're trying to convince them or show them, rather, that they're living inconsistently because they're borrowing the Christian worldview, and how could they not? Because they're all made in the image of God. But more than that, they, it's not that they don't know the truth, they're just spending their sinful life suppressing it, pushing it down, ignoring it, pretending it's not there, you see. Paul makes this argument as he continues in verse 19 of Romans 1. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, for his, both his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen. Being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. In other words, nobody's going to be able to stand on judgment day, look Jesus in the face, and go, man, if somebody would have just made a better argument, right? God's going to go, I made the best argument. And you looked at it every day when you walked outside your door when you were able to feed your family, when you took every breath of air that you took. Verse 21, for even though they knew God, Romans says they knew God, uh, they did not glorify him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their thoughts. So not glorifying God leads to futile thoughts and their foolish heart was darkened. Do you want to guard yourself from sin? Do you want to guard yourself from living like uh, those who have not been freed? Well, just make sure you don't glorify God. But if you glorify God, that's protection. Verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the likeness of corruptible man and of the birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures of sports, of course, speaking of idolatry here. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts, which we'll talk about here in a minute, to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And then verse 26 26 says, For this reason God gave them over to dishonorable passions, for their females exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural, and in the same way the males abandoned the natural function of the female and burned in their desire toward one another. Males with males committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to an unfit mind. You see, what happened here is that God poured down his wrath on humanity that rejected him, refused to glorify him by giving them fire from heaven? No. By giving them what they want. 
because he knew that that would be far more judgment than to just burn them up. To burn them up would just stop them. Oftentimes we need to think about judgment in our own lives or in a nation much like this. Sometimes judgment is God giving you exactly what you want. That's the scariest thing that can happen to some people who will not listen to the truth, who will not bend their knee. Go. Show me how much happier you'll be. Show me how much joy will be in your life. Show me how this really is better. And so this judgment will produce a mind that cannot think God's thoughts after him, that cannot desire God, but rather desires idolatry. And Paul is saying, don't be like that. Don't walk like that. Don't, don't think like that. And the reason it begins here, and the reason that Paul begins here, is because man's sinfulness flows out of his mind. Right? Romans chapter 12 tells us what? That we are to re be renewed in our minds. Transformation must begin with the mind. Everything works its way through the brain to the heart. Why? Because our minds govern the way that we think about things, and the way that we think about things influences everything else. Here's what this means, guys, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, and I'm not just saying this because I like to get degrees. It's just true. Christianity is cognitive before it is experiential. You have to know truth before you can believe and know experientially the truth. Which means getting into the verses, getting into the Greek, getting into all of these things matters. It is our thinking that makes us consider the gospel and our thinking that causes us to believe uh, the historicity and the reliability of the historicity of the claims made in the Bible. It is also our thinking that helps us to apprehend, after we, of course, get help from the Spirit, apprehend the truths of the gospel, and to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. That is why the first step, the first step in repentance is, to cha is a change of mind. Repent and believe is the message of John the baptizer. Repent and believe is the message of Jesus Christ. Repent and believe is the message that has been repeated over and over and over and over again throughout the pages of the New Testament. It is a complete change of mind about what? Oneself, one's spiritual condition, and God himself. What do I mean by that? In order for one to correctly repent, they've got to correctly ascertain what the Bible has to say about them. This is why it's so damnable when every preacher, not every preacher, that's too strong, when a lot of preachers in our city feel fine or in our nation, feel fine getting up behind a pulpit or whatever they get behind and saying, we don't need to talk about repentance. People hear bad things enough. Now, the problem that exists in our churches and in our world is people don't actually hear it enough. That They've not come to the cognitive position uh, that they need a savior, uh, that they must change their ways, and that they are sinners and that their minds do not understand the truth that is offered to them oftentimes. That our spiritual condition is one that is dire, that we are spiritually dead, and that we need to be spiritually revived, and that God is holy, and that God has sent his Son 
in the likeness of sinful flesh to ransom souls. So here we see that the, the mind is futile. It's darkened. Our understanding doesn't work. Shrouded in blindness. Beneath the cloud of ignorance, unable to see the beauties and glories of the gospel. Our sin gets in the way of us hearing the gospel. And Paul's saying, listen, if you keep thinking like a Gentile, you're either proving you're not a Christian or you're going to make it extremely hard for you to grow in Christ's likeness because you must have ears to hear. And you must not be so perverted in here that you can't hear what's coming from out here. And what's interesting is in the Bible, ignorance and sin, stupidity and sin, uh, being blind and sin are always inseparable. As we have looked at 2 Timothy in the evenings, um, you remember Paul saying to Timothy that, that there are men who exist who are always learning. They're, they're always stuffing their brains with stuff. They do know all the Greek words. They do have all the commentaries open. They do have teaching positions in churches or even in seminaries or even have TV shows where they're teaching the Bible. And yet they never are able, as Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 7, able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Why? Well, before we answer the question why, let's look at the other part of this. Because of that, they are alienated from the life of God. Now, the word alienation here, if you continue on, right? Uh, in the futility of their mind, 18, being darkened in their mind, and also alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. So they are ignorant of the things of God because they are alienated from the life of God. That is that people who suffer from such a mind are separated like a stranger barred from entering a city. Uh, the Gentiles, the sinners, as it were, although we are all sinners, don't hear what I'm not saying here, but the people who live in it, love it, want it, prize and prioritize it, uh, these people have an ignorance that is not innocent. Right? They're alienated from the life of God, not, not, not because God has done something, but because they have been ignorant. They have walked in the futility of their mind and have willingly been darkened in their understanding. It's a willful ignorance, and it's a heart-hardening truth. Spiritual deadness marks those without Christ, and it makes them unable to receive Christ. And so oftentimes when we think about salvation... Uh, it must be important to note that people who Christ has not predestined, as Paul talked about, right, in, in, in chapter 1, it's, if they have not been predestined, if they have not been chosen, if they have not been pursued, then they will never come to Christ. And it's not because Christ said they're not allowed to, but it, because it's because they won't. They can't because they won't. It's not because they it won't because they can't. Right? They can't because they won't. Children, would you look at me for just a second? Think about it this way. Have you ever played a game in the dark? When I was younger, uh, the church that I was a part of, and maybe this is an idea, I don't know, they would create a maze in the building with boxes and they would put it in a dark room and you'd have to like go through it and it was extravagant it had like multiple stories if you will and it was really cool but you couldn't see a thing which made it even cooler and you're just groping around and in certain places in that play in in that maze there were there was sometimes candy or or bibles or or different random things and you wouldn't even know what they were, and you'd have, to, you'd have to like use your hands to find where you're going, and then if you found something, you may not even know what it was till you get out. It was really fun. 
Maybe you've played a game like that where you have been in the dark or maybe you've gotten up in the middle of the night and you've tried to find your parents and you're using your hands because you don't know what's going on. That's what's happening to sinners apart from Christ. It's as if they are groping through a pitch black maze and they are completely oblivious to the way out because they don't want to know the way out, which would be different than that scenario, but all analogies begin to break down at some point. So I think at this point, Paul wants us to consider how often we imitate uh, this type of thinking, the world's futile thinking. How often we trust in worldly philosophies or how often we empty ourselves of Christ. That is, emptying ourselves of what we believe about him and what he has done for us. How often do we let the world influence our minds, not understanding that the Bible ought to govern and renew our minds? Because there's only one wisdom that leads to life, and that is the wisdom taught by Christ. Now, the plot deepens, and this is my third point. This is another thing that I want you to know. The callousness of corrupt hearts. The reason that our minds are so defiled and deficient is because our hearts are corrupted and callous. Once again, the mind and the heart are also not often separated in the Bible in the way in which we think about it in the Western world. And so it's important to note this reality. Look with me at the end of verse 18. It says, because of the hardness of their heart. So Gentiles, sinners apart from Christ, are futile in their thinking. They are darkened and willingly blind. They are alienated from the life of God because they're ignorant of the things of God. And the reason for that is not because their thinker is broken, though it is. And it's part of it. But the heart of the matter is the heart itself. In other words, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. With piercing clarity here, Paul shifts from the mind to the heart and describes for us a desanitation of sin. In other words, what he's doing is saying, when we think like that, it's because we have a heart that doesn't see sin as sin. They become callous in their hearts. Their consciences have been seared. This heart, a calloused heart, means a heart that is well, first of all, it's one that feels no shame. It's a heart that feels no sorrow. It only craves and cherishes the sin that they love. The Greek here, and when he uses the word hardness, is speaking of something that is thick. The idea here is a heart that, that is rock hard. And that makes sense when you think about the promises of the gospel and say Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 37 where he says he's going to take this heart of stone out of us and he's going to give us a heart of flesh, one that beats red with blood for him. But you see, when we walk like the Gentiles or we are apart from Christ, uh, we are engaging the world and the things around us in our own sin with a heart that literally can't even feel the sin in front of it. And this is why 
unregenerate people do what they do all the time, and it only increases in severity. And this is why when people fall into sin and they continue in that sin, they continue to grow that sin because the heart becomes hard, and the more hard it becomes, the more they give their sin a pass, and the more they engage in it. This word is used uh, and was used in uh, this time period by physicians to describe even the calcification that forms around broken bones and becomes harder uh, for the bone itself to heal. Now, I don't know anything about how that works medically, but I do know by experience that one time I broke my finger. I was just a little boy and I was hanging out in Tennessee with my family and my uncle went to go leave and my family is from the hollers and so, you know, the best thing that we had available to keep windows open at that time was a really, um, you know, very unsound ruler. And these, but these were old windows and so they were about 157 pounds a piece. And so I, being the little boy that I was, not caring about anything, ran up and was like, hey man, see you, I'll see you later, come on back whatever, I don't know, knocked this ruler out, window fell down on my hand, broke my, uh, you know, opposite ring finger, ring finger. And my mom thought I was just being a baby. And so she didn't take me to the hospital. Now, she wasn't a neglectful mother or anything like that. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I know how that might sound coming out of my mouth right now. Mom, if you're watching, I'm not calling you a neglectful mother. Uh, but I didn't wind up going to the hospital right away, but I, I, I didn't ever stop complaining about it. And so my mom was like, well, there's probably something wrong here if he hasn't just moved on. And we go to the hospital and they're like, yeah, this was a nasty break. I'm going to have to re-break it because the bone has already started to heal and it already started to calcify. And so if we want to fix this thing and for it to grow right, we got to break it again. And so he was like, give me your finger. And I was like, you are insane. I'm not going to let you break my finger. You just told me what you were going to do, Right. But that's what's going on. Uh, Our hearts become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. By the deceitfulness of sin, and we love it. We love it, and we become then unresponsive to the truth. This is why in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 5, Paul says, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. You see, not knowing God produces lustful passions, and those passions enable us to think wrong thoughts about the wrong things and then to do the wrong things. Just as a corpse cannot hear a conversation in a mortuary, right? No one's listening in on you talking about them at their funeral. The person who is spiritually dead or is spiritually dying cannot hear or understand the things of God, no matter how loudly or clearly they may be declared, and definitely no matter how much evidence is put before them. People do not believe evidences because they don't want to. And this leads to, and we've got to move past this somewhat quickly, to an abandonment of Christ towards sensuality, right? He goes on. And they, having become callous, right, these, this mind and heart problem, have they, having become callous, have given themselves over. In other words, they decided to, to go headlong into, not entertain, not slip and fall, but rather to give themselves over to sensuality, to to cherish, to go headlong in to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. This word sensuality points to an overindulgence and lust without restraint. It's like a fire that begins in the heart and, and it only intensifies, leading from one sin to the next, chasing the desires of uh, our wicked hearts. And the reason for that is because the human heart without Christ becomes an insatiable 
a void driven by darkness. The reason that you see Hitlers in the world, for example, although for some reason on the internet it's really popular to not, to, to not make much of how bad he is, and I don't understand that, but it is 2024. The reason that there's Hitlers in the world, the, the reason that there are, you know, you turn on the news and now all you hear about is uh, that rapper Diddy or whatever, and you see about all those crazy things, and the reason that there are even sinners anywhere at the level at which they are is because you can never feed sin enough. And your heart is always capable of becoming more stony, more calloused. That's just the truth of it. And a man who, or a woman who, exists in this or prefers to run back to it, has essentially learned, learned to not flinch at moral decay. It is their callousness and that causes them to do so. But there is, and this is my fourth point, a way out. The reason that we as Christians do not have to engage in this type of thinking and loving, that we can have the mind of Christ and that we can have a heart is because, and this is my fourth point, Christ has a classroom wherein he teaches. So the fourth point is the clarity of Christ's classroom. The clarity of Christ's classroom. He goes on and he says... But you, speaking of course to the Ephesians and us by extension, but you did not learn Christ in this way. Uh, Though you have been learning from the world and your own desires and though you've been trusting in your own way of thinking and loving the wrong things, you did not learn Christ in this way. Do not act this way. Do not think this way. Do not love this way. Way because you did not learn Christ in this way. Paul contrasts this callousness with the clear, direct teaching of Christ. He declares, as we have said, you did not. This is emphatic. And you did not learn. And this verb here implies personal instruction as if from the master teacher or master discipler to the student or the pupil. So this is Christ teaching his people himself through the teaching that Paul has been teaching. And we've seen this already once before as we've looked back. Um, you know, when, when, when in verse 17 of chapter 2, Jesus came and preached the good news of peace to those who were far away. Well, how did he do that if he was ascended on high? Through the preached word. In the same way, they have learned Christ and they have got, gotten the mind of Christ. Um, in other words, there is a certainty here. Unlike the world's Feudal mind and feudal speculations, learning from, the, uh, learning from Christ is immensely true and immensely personal. Christ doesn't teach from afar. He goes to the far places. And as we looked at last week, he is the good shepherd who speaks to his sheep. His teachings are close by. He's accessible. And he is always present all of the time. And he instructs in Truth. Now, I want you to see something that happens here. You did not learn Christ in this way. And then we have this word, if. Verse 21. If indeed. Right? Because he can't be certain that every person who he's speaking to is actually saved. In fact, there's probably a good chance that a majority of the people he's talking about may not be saved. Or some, at the very least. Because not everybody who says they're a Christian is a Christian. Not everybody who says, I'm going to walk as a Christian, and even looks for a time that they are walking as a Christian, are not always Christians. And so he says this, if indeed you heard him and were taught in him, 
just as truth is in Jesus. There's these two words here that show us what it means to be taught by the Lord Jesus Christ in his classroom. The word hear and the word taught. If you heard the gospel and you received it and you loved it, you learned Christ. You learned Christ. You learned Christ. In other words, you received him. You internalized the the promises of the gospel. You, You saw Christ's words for what they were, real words and not empty words. You see his commands as not rules, but divine directives for you to to walk worthy and to make you more joyous and more happy, right? Because his, his laws are not a burden. And Jesus here is put forth as this great teacher whose teaching cuts to the heart. And, and when it does, it brings clarity and conviction. But what this is speaking about is the new birth, right? If you have heard, that means the Holy Spirit has opened up your ears to hear. And if you've been taught, that means your will has been moldable by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that can only happen because he opens up the heart, because he opens up the mind, he changes the heart, he changes the mind, and now you can move forward. Having learned Christ in the right way, You don't have to engage in the way that everybody else engages. You don't have to live like everyone else lives, even if you have to live by yourself and do it by yourself. And so how do we, as Christians, actually walk worthy? Well, we've talked about it for weeks as we have engaged how to be a member of the body in verses 1 through 16. But another way is by not wanting to walk like Gentiles, not wanting to walk like people who have given themselves over to sin, but rather believing that we don't have to, believing that the Lord Jesus Christ has freed us from Satan's sin, death, and hell by the power of his beautiful cross. And so the last thing that I want you to see is the fruit of effectual teaching. The fruit of effectual teaching, as we see in verses 22 and following, when we receive Christ, when we learn Christ, uh, we are effectually given a new heart and a new mind that loves the things God loves And thinks God's thoughts after him. The result, in other words, of Christ's teaching is that Christ is in us. His spirit is in us. And having heard him and having been taught in him, we continue then throughout the course of our Christian lives to bear fruit, growing in holiness, and slaying sin and continually putting off the old man who continues to grab hold of us. So in other words, Christ's classroom is marked by transformation, not just information. And this helps us understand how the Bible works as it truth gets into our heads and into our hearts, right? Truth leads not to just knowing more stuff, but truth ought to lead us to godliness. But when we don't know Jesus or or we lay down the truths of Jesus for a time, What are we doing? As truth comes at us, we get more and more hardened. Right? Because the end is not to know more stuff. For me, this is something I think about and I've thought about a lot this week, especially as I'm preparing for this text, is am I looking at this text? Of course I have to preach to the people of heritage. Of course I do. That's what you pay me to do, among many other things. 
But am I doing it so that I can do that? Am I getting in the Word so that I can do that? I have to protect my heart in that. This is for me first. And not believing that will cause me to to build callousness over my heart. And I will inevitably, inevitably fall into what's being said here. Wrong thinking, wrong loving, and wrong feeling. We must understand that truth doesn't lead to an opportunity to talk about truth. But rather, truth leads to godliness, Christ-likeness, walking worthy, not walking like sinners. When we truly hear Christ, our minds are renewed, our hearts are changed, and that truth saturates, yes, our thinking, but in so doing, it uproots old patterns of sin and establishes new ones in the likeness of of God and it forms us and changes us. It lays us bare and corrects us. So in Christ's instruction, we are made holy, reflecting his character. His teaching produces in us humility, purity, love, and truth. Just as water shapes a rock over time, Christ's word shapes our souls. Right? The word of God, Christ's word is like water that runs over hard stones. And so as we leave this morning, I want, you have, I want you to have taken these lessons from Christ's divine classroom. I want you to be reminded of the call to, to walk worthy, and not to walk as the world, but as citizens of heaven underneath this heavenly school teacher. Because Christ himself has spoken in the hearts of everyone who believes, telling you the truth. And if you have heard his voice, you have been taught in him. And so you must heed his teaching. You must abandon the futility of the worldly, fleshly mind. And you must live as those molded by the hands of the master and not by sin. Leave behind the vanity of the Gentiles. Embrace the truth of Christ and let the life of God engulf you. That's what we do as Christians. Now, does that mean that we will never sin? Uh, does, Does it mean that we will never fall on our face? No. No. Our hearts are wicked. Deceitful among all things, Jeremiah says, who can trust it? Now, of course, we get a new one. But for some reason, that heart loves the old heart and wants it back. And that's why there's forgiveness. That's why there's the body. That's Paul's point, right? He's just spent a ton of time talking to us about the body and about how, it, how the body of Christ is to uh, stand alongside one another and to help them repent of sin and to change and be transformed. And then he says, oh, by the way, you're not to sin. But you will sin. He just told us that. So we do what we're supposed to do and not be lured back into thinking that we should sin and not believing the lie that we don't, that we can't say no to sin, but trusting in Christ, having been taught by him and moving forward. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this text. And we ask that you would help us to grow in holiness and that you would help us not to think and act and feel like the Gentiles, uh, but as freemen, as ones who have been bought and purchased by the blood of your son, Jesus. And we ask this in his name. Amen.